Okay, went back to Lakehurst again, and now it's Snoopy. That's the shirt. <laughs> Being on the crew, this, this is my official crew shirt for the Snoopy blimp. And um, by this time, you notice that in these pictures we're sharing airports a lot more with other blimps. Um, the picture on the upper left is our home base, uh, Kissimmee Airport. Uh, the picture on the upper right is at, taken at Goodyear, Arizona, and that was the very first light ship. That was for flying for Pepsi at the time. And during our stay there, I introduced our, one of our pilots, Jim Dexter, to the uh, man who was building those blimps, another Jim, Jim Field. And um, the two of them got along very well, and Jim eventually left our company, and now he's the director of operations with a light ship group in his offices in England. But he's very frustrated, he's really a pilot, he doesn't like the paper pushing. But uh, we were in Kissimmee, Florida, and we were visited by many other ships. Uh, the Senator is the Fuji airship that came to visit us. Then we had uh, another Pepsi blimp, this was for Diet Pepsi, and that was a sky ship, which was a much longer blimp. That blimp on the right is 200 feet long. Ours was 187 feet long. Uh, then the bottom left hand picture is uh, another shot, a pretty shot of uh, our blimp to Sydney, with your blimp way in the background. And then the bottom right picture was something that was really funny, because that was taken here in the New York area. That was at the public airport, right after the snow. So it actually, we were here late enough in the year where it snowed on the blimp, making for a lot of problems. Because the snow had to wait for the blimp, and when the blimp was heavy already, we had to take off as much. Uh, all the seats were taken out, we took off the engine uh, calendar and everything just to make it look light enough so it wouldn't collapse with the snow. Now, 40 years after my initial experience with the two Goodyear blimps, the only blimps in the world, now there's so many different types of blimps that it's just, it's amazing that the technology is in, uh, growing and there's more development in Europe than there is here in the United States. But uh, briefly, uh, uh, starting on the top row from the left, it's a famous Goodyear blimp, which is pretty much the same, although the paint being is different, it's still pretty much the same as it was back in the 60s when it was here, it's just a little bit longer because of the night time. The next picture is the Fuji blimp over New York. In the next picture, you see the two blimps, and that's the light ships that are currently flying. The one on the left is a lot larger than the one on the right. The one on the left can hold about 10 people, and the one on the right can hold four. Um, the one on the left is about 165 feet long, and the other one is 135 feet long. Then the Gulf airship was a similar ship to the one that I flew back uh, in the 80s. That's the same type as the uh, McDonald's, a different airship, but the same manufacturer. Uh, in the second row, the two ships on the left were built by a friend of mine from Memphis, Tennessee, Steve Garner. The first ship was a one-man airship. Then the second man, the second ship was a two-man airship that was uh, sold to an ecology group down in uh, Florida. And they used it for a few months to uh, make people more aware of, you know, the uh, presence of the animals and not to uh, harm the manatees, for example. And they also were able to fly um, and educate the public and fly passengers occasionally, and also do some studies from the blimp because the, the blimp gives you a unique opportunity to see something at a very slow rate, so it doesn't scare the animals. So they use the blimps now for a lot of scientific research. The next one is a, a new airship that's just coming online. It's the AT-10, and that's built by this. Its designer is the same person who designed the Fuji blimp, but it's much smaller. It's more like the, um, the blimp that the light ships are using. Then the next blimp is very interesting because that's not a blimp. It's a semi-rigid airship, and that's a Zeppelin. The Zeppelins are coming back again. There are three that are currently flying in Europe, and one is being sent to Japan, and it's going to be sent there this summer and they're tracing the route of the original Graf Zeppelin flight that went from Germany to Japan. So that could be very exciting. What's the difference between an airship and a Zeppelin? Um, good question. Um, airship and dirigible is a generic term, but there are three types of airships. There's a rigid airship, which is like the old Zeppelins that used to fly with the framework. Semi-rigid airships, like the Zeppelin, have a frame inside, but if you were to take the helium gas out, it would collapse. So it does have some structure to carry the, the weight of the engine. And then, of course, the blimp has no structure at all inside of it. So those are the three types of airships. Now, the two on the bottom left are Russian-built airships. Those are coming online now. Those are two new technology airships. Uh, the one, uh, the second from the left, is now the type that's currently flying in California. Then the next blimp is the baseball blimp. It's totally round. And it was here in Queens. We hadn't seen it a few years ago. 
We did fly it because we air inflated it right next to the unisphere. And uh, it's a new concept. But that's, if you read about the papers now, you're reading about the stratosphere, about these new airships that are going to be going to 40,000, 60,000 feet, carrying uh, telecommunications and doing defense work. Well, the person who uh, designed that airship is doing that work. They're using the round um, configuration for their type of um, you know, operations. And then finally, the little blip on the uh, bottom right is a privately owned airship, and it's, uh, it's got aliens on the side. It's a Buddy Thompson airship, but it's basically in the hangar. It doesn't fly very much anymore. But it was painted by Bert Dodge. As a matter of fact, let's see. Bert painted the Fuji ship on this, and I guess that's it. But he did the Budweiser ship, he did the Pink Floyd ship, uh, he did a lot. Yeah. But you know, we come to the problem, like what I was saying before, is where are the groups going to park? Now, the picture on the left was taken in 1986 when I was flying uh, at Paul Rule, New Jersey. That was during the, the blimp race uh, week. And Goodyear had two blimps here, and they were able to use the two spots of Peterborough. Both of those spots were no longer able to be used. The picture on the right, it's not a very clear picture, but we were trying to land. And the problem is that that tree line that's on the bottom of the picture on the left-hand side is what, we're, what I'm trying to show in the picture on the right. The trees, that was in 1986, but 16 years later, those trees really grew a lot. And it makes, that's a very small area for a blimp to operate in. And when the tree line grows, the angle of attack to land to the crew increases. It makes it a lot more dangerous. And that's an active runway over there. You can see the, the plane on the runway. And they were afraid that if a plane was coming in or taking off and the blimp overshot the, uh, the crew, that there could be a bad accident. So they now closed that uh, facility. We had been in New Jersey used to have three or four blimps, but that is no longer available. Westchester is no longer available. So the blimps now park over 40 miles away, and it takes a blimp about an hour to get into the city. The only exception to that is the Fuji blimp, which uses um, Floyd Bennett Field, because when they're in town, they do a lot of work for Homeland Security. So we need real estate. And who would benefit? You know, people who manufacture the airships, they want their airships to be seen. The people who operate the airships, the clients like Goodyear or MetLife or whoever. But I think the city would do wonderful with their um, economic development and tourism. You could bring a lot of money in. You know, it would be something unique. Uh, I'm willing to offer up uh, my collection uh, to start a museum and everything. But if we don't, identify what could be useful for airships now, all that property will be developed eventually and we won't have anything. And what do we need? We really don't need that much. We want it just a large grassy area. We want to pave over just a little spot from the point where the mooring mast is to where the gondola is so that in case any fuel spills or like when it rains, you don't have to walk in mud. The two types of mooring masts that airships use today are as demonstrated on the right are the expeditionary mast, which you have to build, it comes in three sections, and you have to put the stakes into the ground, and then you pull it up, and then you tie the rest of the stakes off. The bottom one uses a mobile mast. They also use stakes that you could actually go out with the uh, truck and you can loop the airship uh, and the nose up, and then you can bring the airship wherever you want to bring it. So it makes it a lot easier on the crew when you have something like that. Well, the blimp flies at regulated altitudes. For example, when they're working in the New York airspace, the, the control tower tells them how high they can fly. Usually we fly between 1,000 and 1,500 feet. It's very low, so you can see, you can hear dogs barking when you're flying in the blimp and everything. You can wave, people know you're on the ship, they can recognize you and everything. Yeah. Well, he's, uh, but your blimp used when they had the camera in the uh, the blimp when they were operating at Flushing Airport. They would go low and slow outside my window with the camera to see if they could catch me in my skiddies. <laughs> Why is that? Yeah. Basically, what we did is we came up with a blimp port concept, and the concept was to have mooring spots, a spectator area, a museum, theme restaurant, terminal for the uh, pilots and crew, and also weather you know full weather radar and communications with all the airports nearby. And I remember back in the days when uh, I was part of the Goodyear Bloom crew and how proud I was because everybody in the neighborhood loved blimps. And if they saw me wearing my Goodyear Bloom shirt, they would come over and ask questions and everything. Nobody doesn't like a blimp. And they do a lot of public service. Now, when that picture was taken, the same water picture, that was taken in 1965, Mayor Wagner at the time, along with uh, his water commissioner, um, DeAndrea was the name, they took a blimp upstate to look at the reservoirs. 
it took two blips. One blip was for the, uh, the mayor and his uh, staff, and the other blip was for the press. And they flew very low and slow, they had like a three hour flight over the reservoirs. They came back and had a press conference. And for the rest of the summer, the Goodyear blimp was advising New Yorkers to sell safe water because the, we were less than 50% in the reservoirs back then. But the blimp's uh, perspective from that, from that blimp ride, they were able to really look low and slow and see where all the problems were. And uh, they were really able to study the problem from that level. And they found it to be very useful. We would hire locally. We want to hire people from the area. And uh, we also want to you know, be able to give out public service rides and also be able to do homeland security with the blimps and everything. Uh, you may not be aware of it, but most of the time we do see blimps over New York, they are doing uh, work for either the FBI or the police department now. I lost the ride last year because I had to give it up for a policeman. Who's the top five positions in this? Who doesn't want The city doesn't want it because they don't see that it'll make enough money for that. <laughs> see, that's a problem. <laughs> you know, it's a, we will create jobs and we wouldn't. When I was trying to see, the problem with, with what I was proposing, you might remember I was proposing the blimp port, and the reason why I didn't actually submit my proposal. First of all, the city didn't give me enough time. They didn't allow enough time for us to really do a good job. But we knew that we had to compete with developers that were going to be putting in $40 million bids, $50 million, $60 million bids, which is something that we couldn't, in our plan, we couldn't justify that cost. But on the other hand, how do you justify like when a blimp is in town if, if all a blimp has to do one time is do something that discover, you know, something amiss and save hundreds of lives? Isn't it worth you know, the price, but the city's not listening because they want to sell the property to other developers. Well, actually, that's a good point. Uh, I was working with the Guardia Airport because there is a concern about like, the, the intermix of the traffic with the slow blimps and the, and the jet. But the, um, over College Point, we have what's called an, an exclusion, which means that the big airplanes can't fly over here. So that separates the blimps from the airplanes. If the uh, Flushing Airport is not an aviation facility by the year 2012, then the FAA is going to reconsider all the airspace in the country, and eventually what might happen is they'll allow the jets to fly over College Point because there's no more airport in College Point. Well, see, the thing is, um, who would use a blimp for a terrorist attack? I can just see now a, a, a terrorist would steal a good year blimp and it bounces off the three buildings. Now, this is a composite picture, but basically what we're looking for is there's a large triangular area that, that Flushing Airport had. Let me show you. What we're looking to do is we're trying to develop from this area to this area, we would have the airships. And then this area in the north section, we want to do community facilities. We'd like to put in things that kids would like, maybe a miniature golf course with an airship theme, and things like that. So this, this whole section here, we wanted to share with other developers because we really only want to operate maybe one or two blimps in this section here. Well, no, because the surrounding, see, what, what's good about it is there's a lot of wetlands that surround the airport, so nothing could be built around the airport, so the airships could land and take off without any interference. So the water is actually a good thing for us. We don't need that much room. Uh, maybe a thousand feet by a thousand feet, and you can put two blimps there. And I still see by the same thing that filled the then a few of the Zeppelin that exploded back in the 30s or 40s when the Zeppelin would be crashed. Well, that was hydrogen. That had nothing, and that, that's nothing to do. That technology will never exist again. And technology will never exist again? No, because nobody will ever use hydrogen for an airship again. So that's why it won't happen. But as you can see, this is the area that we want to use. And, and you can see that what we did is we took a picture that somebody else took. Jay Begg, as a matter of fact, was a photographer from College Point. He was flying, he was a pilot that used to fly out of Flushing Airport and he saw the blimp landing one day and he took that picture in the upper right. What we did is we twisted it around just to show you how much room is, is on the airport property. So, so we would have plenty of room, but unfortunately the city doesn't want us to do what we want to do. And finally, in this last section, how many people here have actually flown on a blimp? Has anybody actually flown on a blimp? One person. Okay. People always ask me, what's it like up there? And what does it feel like? And to answer that question, I would say, you're not, you're not, you're not flying an airplane, you're not hitting the bumps or anything like an airplane. It's more like you're on a boat. And the thermals and all those little air pockets create a wave for you, and you go up and down. And the pilots always have to be aware, like, like especially in the summer, when you're flying 
especially if you're flying over the city, you get thermals, and the thermals will push the blimp up. So the pilot always has to be aware of his altitude, because when, when they tell you at LaGuardia, stay at 3,000 feet, they need 3,000 feet. So if you find that you're going up because the, uh, the uh, thermals are pushing you up, and you have to put the nose down, and you have to gun the engine down a little bit. Pilots that I've flown with, all the pilots are very, very good. And I, I don't think I've ever had any bad blimp flights. But you can see the views uh, from a blimp are so different because you're flying low, you're flying slow, windows are open, you can actually wave to people, and you really can hear sounds on the ground. You just get a unique perspective. And that's why Homeland Security, is, uh, the Coast Guard, uh, the City Police Department are all looking at the blimps now as a way of controlling the city. Helicopters are good for some things, but they're not good for everything. And here are some shots that I took over the years from the blimps of Queens. The upper right hand, uh, uh, the upper left hand shot is a picture taken over College Point in Mitchell Linden. And you can see Flushing Airport's in the center. Then you got Main Street next to that. Then Flushing High School. Then you got the Bay Club in the upper right hand corner. In the second row you have uh, Queens College. Then you have Jackson Heights with the uh, Fuji Bun flying next to us. Then a picture of LaGuardia from 1986. And Forest Hills, you can see the stadium uh, in the picture on the right in the middle. And then on the bottom, you have the Citibank building, you have um, the Silver Cup Studios, and then two pictures taken at the World's Fair. And if you notice, we were flying right over the New York State pavilion, and you can see the map is still there, the map of New York State. That's it. So if anybody wants to follow us out, that's it. Ha ha ha!